We have talked about how a fluid changes its velocity when the size of the channel changes. We also know from our kinematics equations that if the velocity of an object increases, then the kinetic energy also increases. If we go back to our fluid flowing through a changing channel, we can look at it in terms of how much work is being done. The first section has a certain area, A1. The same volume of fluid in the smaller channel has a smaller area, A2. Fluid 1 moves some distance, x1, over a certain amount of time, and fluid 2 moves some distance, x2, in the same amount of time. Notice that x1 is a smaller distance than x2 because fluid 1 is moving at a slower velocity than fluid 2. So why is fluid 1 moving in the first place? Well, we know there is some force pushing the fluid from the left, so it moves through the channel. As we know from a while back, that force is equal to the pressure times the area. Over on fluid 2, there is a force pushing backwards, which is also equal to the pressure times the area. Ultimately, what we are looking at is how that pressure is changing when the channel size changes. We know that the work done is the force acting over some distance. So the force acting to the right on fluid 1 times the distance that fluid moves is the work done by that fluid. Since we are dealing with fluids, we probably want to take into account the pressure. So we can say that the work done by the fluid is equal to the pressure acting on the fluid times the area of the fluid times the distance the fluid travels. Now you might also notice that the area times the distance is equal to the volume of the fluid. So we can also write it in terms of that. So that gives us several nice ways to express that work relationship. In the same way, we can describe the work being done on the right as the pressure times the change in volume. The only difference here is that the work is being done in the opposite direction, so it becomes a negative. Now wait a minute, because before we decided that the volume 1 was equal to volume 2. This means that we can combine some terms here. It makes sense that the total work done is work 1 plus work 2. Substitute in our pressure and volume expressions, and we find that pressure times volume gives us the amount of work done by a fluid. Since the two volumes are the same, we can pull that out and make our expression just a little bit simpler. Now remember that if we have a network being done, then we also have a change in our kinetic energy. So final kinetic energy, which will be f describing fluid 2, minus the kinetic energy of fluid 1, is equal to the network done by the fluid. In turn, we can substitute in the expression for kinetic energy. Now, kinetic energy involves mass, so we need to figure out a way to determine the mass of the specific sample of fluid. Well, we probably know what fluid we are working with, and we know our volume of fluid. So we could use the expression for density to find that mass. So kinetic energy of a fluid becomes one-half the volume times density times its velocity squared. We can substitute this in for our network equation that uses the change in kinetic energy. But it gets even better, because remember, again, that volume 1 is equal to volume 2. So we can factor that out of our equation, and when we look at the other side, we see the volume on both sides, so the volume actually cancels out. This is kind of messy, so we're going to move some things around, so all of the expressions for fluid 1 are on the left side, and all the expressions for fluid 2 are on the right side. This gives us the pressure of fluid 1 plus 1 half the density times velocity squared equal to the pressure of fluid 2 plus 1 half the density times velocity squared. This is one form of Bernoulli's equation for small volumes of fluids at a constant depth that are moving along some path. This tells us how the speed changes when pressure changes, or vice versa, how pressure changes when the speed changes. Suppose we have a hose where the speed of water increases from 1.96 meters per second to 25.5 meters per second going from the hose to the nozzle. Calculate the pressure in the hose if the pressure in the nozzle is 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth newtons meters squared. We're looking for the pressure in the nozzle, so let's go ahead and get that by itself uh, by just subtracting the part about kinetic energy of the nozzle. This looks pretty intimidating, but really we have all our information and we just need to get it in the right spot. If you wanted, you could do a little bit more algebra and factor out the one half as well as the density from those expressions. And here I just plug them in. Either way, you end up with a pressure in the nozzle of 4.24 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared, which is quite a bit more than the pressure in the hose. 
Again, this does fall in with what we expect since the velocity in the nozzle is more than the velocity in the hose. Bernoulli's principle is essentially another way to express the conservation of energy. We have a change in kinetic energy on one side, so that must mean that there is a change in energy on the other side. If this is true, then pressure must be a type of energy. So a change in pressure would cause a change in the energy. We have seen this with the movement of the fluid through different channels. Now we can take that idea and talk about what happens if a fluid moves vertically. We know already that the pressure of a fluid changes with depth. The higher up in our atmosphere something is, the less pressure it experiences. If that object moves down in the atmosphere, the pressure on it increases. According to Bernoulli's principle, the change in pressure should correspond to a change in energy. So now let's take a fluid that is moving through a channel. The container is the same size all the way through, but the fluid must go through a vertical change in distance. The fluid will be moving through the channel at some velocity v. If the area of the channel does not change, then the velocity in all areas of the channel will be the same. Down here at the bottom, our channel is at some height y. It could be zero, but it does not have to be. At this height, there is some pressure, p1. Now up here, at some other height, y2, there is a new pressure, p2. We have known for a while now that the pressure at this point is the pressure at y1 minus rho gh. In this case, the height is a change in vertical height, or delta y. What we really want to consider with all this is the work that is being done by the pressure within the channel. Because something that we have not thought about yet is that gravity will act on the fluid moving upwards. We know that the work done by gravity has to do with the potential energy of the substance in question. So we can write the expression for this based on an expression for potential energy. Because it is acting in the direction opposite the motion of fluid, we will write this as a negative. Of course, working with fluids, we want to get rid of that mass and we can substitute in rho delta v. So here's the deal. The velocity, remember, does not change because the cross-sectional area of the channel does not change. This means that the network done on the system does not change either. So the work done by the pressure plus the work done by the gravity equals zero. This is a big deal because we can combine those terms and rewrite our equation in one more form. Now again, delta v will cancel and we can move all the one values to the left and all the two values to the right. In this form, we can see how pressure changes when the height of the fluid changes. If we increase the height, then the pressure will go down. You're probably thinking that we already knew this, but this is simply the mathematical expression for that particular phenomenon. Okay, so we have one equation to explain the change in pressure when the cross-sectional area of the horizontal channel changes. And we have an equation to describe the change in pressure when the height of a uniform channel changes. But guess what? Sometimes both cross-sectional area and the height changes. The good news is that because of the law of conservation of energy, we can just combine those two equations. So what we end up with is the initial pressure, which is a form of potential energy, plus the initial kinetic energy, plus the initial gravitational potential energy, equal to the final pressure, plus the final kinetic energy, plus the final gravitational energy. And this is the drawn out form of Bernoulli's equation.